Welcome back, everyone. After a very exciting first session, uh, I can tell you that the regents collectively have expressed a great deal of excitement about what's, what they've heard here. Um, you know, we've had quite a few looks at this, thanks to uh, President Robbins' senior team checking in with us. So seeing it all come together and being presented in the way it, it was presented has really been rewarding for us. Uh, many of our questions were answered before we got here today. So don't, uh, don't misread our lack of questions as our lack of support or a, a lack of uh, true excitement about what we're seeing. Uh, quite the contrary. This group is not shy. And if we see things that we have questions about, President Robbins, you know you'll hear from us. I think you can take the fact that you've become a student-centered plan and um, the exciting new initiatives that you outlined are, are quite exciting for us as well, and we support the, the pillar one and two. So Thank please. You. All right, so we're 15 minutes behind time. I know I'm focusing on time, but I want you to, to be able to, uh, to get to where you need to be. Today, Friday? I think it is Friday, yeah. <laughs> Friday, you know, we need to stop by one on Friday. So this third pillar gets us into um, uh, our people, our place, but it's reimagining uh, the land grant university in the fourth industrial revolution. And, and if, you know, we've talked about uh, President Crow's the new American university and what's our tagline, I, I, I think that it would be uh, the land grant university in the fourth industrial revolution and um you know to to be able to do all the things that we talked about in the first two pillars this one uh, really focuses on our service to the state of arizona through our land grant mission to our people uh, to the place uh, to the soul that is in southern arizona and and all of the connectivity that we have across all of those assets so um, here are the goals. Uh, we've talked about uh, uh, earlier on in Pillar 1, the graduation and retention goals. You'll see that we'll focus on, uh, we've called out uh, our uh, Hispanic Serving Institution Initiative, our service to our Native American students, and then um, uh, we'll end on economic development and how we think that uh, we can do even better than we're doing currently, which is actually much better than I thought we were doing. So we'll get there. So what's, what's the idea around this, um, this new uh, uh, land-grant university for uh, the Fourth Industrial Revolution? If you go back, you know, we, we talk about the Morrill Act and, and serving around agriculture and the, the uh, mechanical arts, engineering. But now, uh, as things are changing very rapidly, uh, we need to apply those new principles to what it means to be a new land-grant university and, and how we can continue to foster development of the entrepreneurial spirit of this university and the state, uh, increase our innovation and, and uh, uh, economic development resources and investment, and then another point uh, that I was alluding to in the, uh, in the first phase was how can we, as an enterprise, collaborate across uh, our three universities. So this shows uh, one of the great strengths, as I was talking about earlier, uh, is the uh, enormously diverse makeup that, that, that we have at the university. Students from uh, every state in the union and uh, many countries from around the world. And, and I would say that we, uh, we have dedicated sites for each one of these centers to operate, but they are woefully inadequate. Uh, I would like to see a separate building for each one of these uh, interest groups so that they can have their own living and learning space uh, and, and they can be more successful. And, and I think it makes, it's a competitive advantage for us. It makes us stronger uh, and it will also investment in these uh, different uh, diversity and inclusion centers will, will help us uh, with retention and graduation rate. Uh, the, the fact that this last year we, uh, we, we received the designation of a Hispanic serving institution, um, you'll see Marla Franco who 
uh, on a video later who's been elevated to a uh, associate vice provost role for uh, Hispanic initiatives. And I think that shows how important this is to the institution. We're only the third AAU university, and remember, there are only 60 AAU universities in the United States, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Stanford, University of Arizona. And we're the only third, uh, third AAU to achieve this designation. It's a sense of great pride for the university. There was a lot of work putting, put into this over decades, uh, and um, it allows us to recruit better students, better faculty that are focused in the, in the areas of uh, advancing our Latino and Hispanic uh, missions. Uh, and, it, and it also opens us up to new funding uh, at the federal level that we didn't have access to uh, earlier. Additionally, we have uh, 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 Rebecca Soshi and it was at our table this morning with Regent Hyler and, and others and talking about the incredible opportunity uh, uh, for our Native American students. Uh, and, and I think that uh, unlike other states where we have the largest concentration of Native American students than any other state, uh, we, we have programs that are already in place. We've got, we've got a long and rich history of, uh, at the University of Arizona of educating uh, our Native students, but we must do better. Um, we, we need to go to the tribal lands and develop deep and meaningful relationships and partnerships to help them uh, in their K through 12 education. And as I said before, even the uh, community college at uh, Tohono O'odham uh, Nation to help them to get students to us and provide programs and understand their needs so that they can be uh, successful and either go back to lead uh, in their tribes or, or to go out and be leaders across all of society. Uh, I think there's a great opportunity for us to have an annual summit, uh, probably in this ballroom, uh, where we bring all 22 leaders of, uh, of our Arizona nations together. And I would even say other nations outside of Arizona uh, in the Southwest. It could be a national, uh, it could be a national conference that should could show our leadership and how we're, uh, here, we're, we have best practices in, in educating our native pop population. So this next video, you're, you're gonna see Rebecca uh, talk about um, our, our efforts around inclusion and excellence. Uh, Rob Williams, who's uh, on this video, is, uh, is one of the eminent and probably the most uh, accomplished uh, attorneys and law professors on indigenous people law. Uh, and uh, I appreciate them and, and Marla Franco being part of this video. This, these are very important initiatives to the university. Uh, uh, these things make us stronger and give us a competitive advantage, as I've said before. Here at the University of Arizona, we're here to affirm that diversity is who we are as a human community and as a university community. We love each of our students. And I can't even tell you how happy it makes me to go into a group and see students from here, students from around the country, and students from around the world who have chosen to study at the University of Arizona. One of the things that HSIs across the nation continue to ask themselves is what does it mean to be a Hispanic serving institution? And one of the things that I'm most proud about in the work that we have just only begun at the University of Arizona is I'm proud to say that we certainly are committed towards putting the S in HSI. We are going to put serving in Hispanic serving institution. Having been here 30 years, and actually this is my third strategic plan, uh, I have to admit, this one's different. Uh, the people that we're working with, the teams uh, that have been assembled, uh, the input that's been gathered, um, you know, building support among stakeholders, talking to tribes, and excitement in our communities about this process and about the possible outcome. This makes me very optimistic and very excited to keep working on this.
Another uh, thing that it permeates across the entire plan of the arts, um, we're blessed. Uh, I think President Schaefer had to leave. Uh, he probably didn't want to see what he looked like in a younger age. Oh, you're still there. There you are. Do you recognize that guy? This is a, this is a young President Schaefer, as I said. He started in his 30s. And I told him that if, if, uh, if he wants to come back, I'll take a sabbatical and he can uh, go back to the job. Uh, but there he is with his friend Ansel Adams. And he, he was key of bringing uh, Ansel Adams' collection here. Uh, and, and making the Center for Creative Photography one of, uh, one of the worldwide uh, international treasures in the field of photography. Uh, but we, we have a new dean, Andy Schulz. I thought I saw Andy here earlier, and we're incredibly lucky to have him, and, uh, and we're going to uh, uh, have him uh, be more than just the dean of fine arts, but the vice president for uh, fine arts across the university, uh, emphasizing that the arts needs to permeate everything we do across the curriculum, across the culture of the university. Uh, of course, we've got a great dance program. Uh, you, you can see at the bottom there, I got to go to, uh, to rehearsal. They call it practice in football, but this was rehearsal. And I told them, you know, uh, don't, don't take this the wrong way, Coach Sumlin, but I said, if, if, uh, if our football players executed as flawlessly as those ballet dancers, we'd be, we would be going to the Rose Bowl. So we have a lot to learn uh, from, from, our, uh, from our dance program. But we need to invest. Uh, we need to invest in the arts. And uh, we have aging infrastructure. T, uh, Craig T. Nelson was here recently helping us try to raise money to redo uh, Moroni Theater, our black box theater, and, and it, it's such an important part of Tucson. Our culture is, as I keep saying, this place has a soul to it, and part of it uh, is the creativity that um, helps our students become uh, better at what they're going to do as they go out in the world. So I've included a picture of, uh, of the Mandavi Center at UC Davis and the Bing Center uh, for performing arts at uh, Stanford. I mean, these these uh, uh, centers in this district that we need to invest in, uh, with a new uh, uh, art museum, a new dance, uh, 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 a new music, Fred Fox Music uh, School. Uh, these are in facilities that need to be invested in and updated. And uh, certainly, as part of this plan, we're going to do that. When you talk about the HSI designation or you talk about the focus on Native American issues at the university, you clearly are, are, are dealing with leveraging place when it gets to those particular groups of students and faculty. But in the arts, tell me how you're going to leverage place through the arts. Well, I think that um, uh, certainly we've got to have facilities uh, uh, I don't. I don't know that uh, Jory and his wife could have built the the dance program that they have here uh, without having great facilities. Uh, certainly, you've got to have great programs to go in those facilities. Uh, but I, I I believe that these performing arts uh, centers, we we have, in my opinion, two porches, two front porches or front doors to the universities, portals into the university with the community. And that's through athletics and the arts. And I, and I think that it's, uh, it's a time when, uh, other than uh, J.P. Jones has this great uh, seminar series down in the Fox Theater and engages the community, and certainly uh, Joaquin's science lecture series and Centennial Hall packs a place. But they don't, the community doesn't really, except in rare occasions, come in and go to English classes or physics classes or things like that. But they get to come and enjoy uh, performances or games. So I think uh, having uh, facilities that people will come to uh, that will attract students, that will attract faculty to build those programs which do attract students is going to be really important. So I'm not sure if that's answering your question, but uh, it, it, it is one of our portals and front porches to the university. I, I think we need to invest uh, uh, in other areas, uh, obviously in Tucson, uh, and this starts to get into the economic development mission of, uh, 
of uh, the University of Arizona being the land grant university for the state. And, and what we are uh, tasked with in terms of our stewardship of being the land grant uh, university. And that's to build out the tech parks uh, that, that started uh, many years ago. We've had this ground uh, um, between the airport and the university called the Bridges. Um, and I'm, I was reminded as I kept driving by there that it was a bridge to nowhere. Uh, but finally, uh, we're gonna move forward and, and start breaking ground on the bridges and build out what Bruce Wright and others uh, conceived of uh, as a plan that I think will be uh, beneficial in that uh, intersection of fundamental discoveries being translated in co into commercializable products. Uh, we're going to develop a, an incubator uh, at uh, the old Walgreens downtown that the, the county has provided us uh, for a long-term lease and we're building that out for and Joaquin and, and Paulo are going to have programs in there, an incubator accelerator. Uh, but, but we need to also build out the Phoenix Biomedical Campus. Uh, the, the board has charged the EEC, which are the uh, three presidents in addition to John, to come together and develop a plan for the Health Sciences Center. And I'll say a little more about that later. We also need to build out uh, our presence in Phoenix because the state legislature is there. It's the largest uh, alumni base of any of our alumni uh, worldwide. And, uh, you know, I get up there as much as I can, but I haven't done as good a job of having a presence in Phoenix and, and speak, uh, you know, uh, at, at public gatherings there like President Crow gets to do because he lives close. So we, we need to build out uh, our, our presence in Phoenix more than we're doing. Uh, and just like ASU, I mean, uh, for those of you who've seen their beautiful building in, uh, in Washington, D.C., right, right out the uh, sort of the west side of the entrance into the, into the White House, uh, we need a presence. Uh, you know, I've, I've kind of uh, provocatively called them uh, uh, embassies at these different locations. Um, it turns out that Duke does call their uh, D.C. office uh, the Duke Embassy. Um, but, but this could be a site for us to uh, focus a lot of the important activities around uh, federal relations uh, with the agencies in particular. It'll be a place for our students to go and do uh, internships and uh, uh, study abroad programs that could be uh, in D.C. Uh, we also have an incredible uh, Institute of Civil Discourse that I, I think that most people don't even realize we have, uh, but it's a phenomenal program and uh, we certainly need civil discourse in this day and age. Uh, uh, I was reminded of going, uh, watching the TV this morning and said, you know, the nation has been even more divided than we are today, and, but that resulted in a civil war. Do you have a question, Regent? I do. Provena? Yes, thank you, Dr. Robbins. Oh, oh there we go. Um, I guess, with speaking about all this expansion, I was hoping maybe you could also touch on like what does the financing of expansion for the university look like? Like as a part of this discussion, how, how do we make this feasible with this going to DC, going to Northern California, which are all important, how do we look at that from a financial perspective? Yeah, we kind of covered that uh, with you guys yesterday, but I'll, uh, I'll expand on what I said yesterday. Uh, obviously, there are resources that are available for strategic investment currently, uh, and we're going to put those uh, things to work. And uh, parenthetically, there are already things in this plan that we're doing uh, currently, uh, and there are things that we will implement very soon that will require no investment. Uh, as I get to the fourth pillar, actually some of our uh, global programs are making money, um, unheard of. Uh, our online program has been de develops that out. That's going to be revenue positive because a lot of the uh, upfront investment has been made. Um, we're also going to look at our budgetary uh, process and uh, see if there are some changes that could be made that would free up some of the money for more strategic investment. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, we, we think that uh, uh, 
if we execute on these strategies, we'll meet, win more grants and more contracts, and we'll get, uh, we'll grow our student uh, uh, body, and we'll have more students to, to be able to have more tuition and and do more things. So that would be sort of the uh, the outline of how we would pay for this, uh, and. Uh, the final thing, of course, would be uh, JP. I don't know if JP's still here, but we talked about it on the break. Um, we're going to have to get out. We, we raised, uh, as I said before, over $300 million uh, last year, the largest amount in the history of the university. We've got to do almost $400 million a year for eight years to hit our goal of between 3 and $4 billion. So um, as we were talking about, uh, when, when Regent Ridenour asked JP, how much money have you raised today? Uh, just think about it. Every day when you wake up, uh, we've got to raise a million dollars every day. Wow. Every day. And that, that'll be a big part of funding this plan. Make sure there's a defibrillator. No pressure, JP. Uh, if JP <laughs> has a cardiac arrest. Yeah, we had hoped to avoid that uh, funding question, but it's good to get it out there. Oops. We can go and Sorry. we can we can go we can go well, into more detail about exactly uh, how we're going to pay for it. So, back to our regularly scheduled programming. Uh, so the uh, I, I think there's another opportunity for us in the Presidio, and why do I pick the Presidio? Uh, President Crow picked uh, L.A. and he moved from Santa Monica. Now he's in in downtown uh, LA and he's announced uh, that um, he's in town um, to compete on par and to dominate USC, UCLA and Caltech. I, I like that. We, we, you know, I have roots in Northern California so we kind of thought about Northern California and the Presidio because there, there's something interesting going on there uh, that the World Economic Forum for the first time in their uh, nearly 50 year history has a branch campus. Uh, that uh, Mark Benioff from Salesforce has, has had a lot of influence, I believe, in establishing this campus there. And it's an opportunity for us to have a presence, much like we would have an embassy in D.C., uh, to have one in Silicon Valley in Northern California, um, so that we can uh, uh, help to uh, expand the tech transfer capabilities, the companies that we spin out to have partnerships with uh, Silicon Valley tech companies, but also get capital investment from venture capitalists in that area. And it puts us in the, in the mix of uh, uh, being able to have access to the Pacific Rim, uh, China, India, Korea, where uh, we are going to build micro campuses and get students from. So this would be uh, sort of our outreach, and we think that this will help us in our quest for economic development for the state, but also help us to make money uh, for the university so that we can invest in this plan uh, and do the great things that we want to do. So um, when I got here, President Crow and I started talking about what could we do together, and we've had a series of uh, meetings that were primarily led by George Post and Mike Dake. Uh, that are really focused around biotech and health sciences and what can we do together. And there are many things that we can do. We already have partnerships with NAU uh, in the Phoenix Biomedical Campus. Uh, and as I said before, the board has charged us, all, all four of our leaders, with coming up with a plan for the uh, biomedical campus. So I, I think we can, uh, we, we can be a, a player in, in that arena. Uh, but as I started to think about this presentation and as I started to think about what we could do as a university uh, and my prior experiences in, in Texas, uh, by the way, I, I was actually hired uh, because 59 institutions said we need someone to come in and help organize us. We want to work together. We need a, a forcing function to set up research collaborations and uh, innovation and uh, 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 economic development type things we could do as multiple institutions together. And it struck me that I've got three examples here. The, the top one is that TMC3 uh, multi-institutional, University of Texas, Texas A&M, Rice, Baylor, uh, MD Anderson coming together uh, to, to have a meaningful 
translational research campus. Uh, the one in the bottom right is, um, is Research Triangle, where University of North Carolina, North Carolina State, and Duke have come together uh, years ago, decades ago now, to build out an infrastructure, and it, and it really put their three universities on the map. And most recently, under the investment of Mayor Bloomberg, the development of Roosevelt Island uh, uh, in New York, uh, where Cornell and the Technion have come together. I think we can do the same thing at the Phoenix Biomedical Campus, but I, as, uh, as we talked yesterday, uh, think that it doesn't need to just be health sciences and biotech. I think we've got a unique opportunity with all of our assets coming together uh, to be the world leader uh, in the business of space, in space exploration, uh, in uh, astronomy and, and those domains. Uh, a lot of it has to do with having the expertise to go into space, but a lot of it also has to do with technology development and data management that will help both health and uh, our space programs. So I, I think this is a big opportunity for us to do something really big and put a uh, to plant a flag in the ground to say we are going to be the leaders. Uh, finally, the governor, uh, in dealing with the governor of Sonora and the possibility of having a uh, uh, launch site for rockets like Vector is producing, the idea is that Vector is producing these rockets that could be fired uh, uh, inexpensively, relatively inexpensively, at the rate of one a day. And uh, so if you think about this whole corridor from, uh, from Arizona through Sonora, uh, I, I think we've got a great opportunity there and the University of Arizona is, is poised and ready to work with the other universities to develop this. So that's the end of pillar three. More questions before we go to global. By, by my, my check, we have 50 minutes and I think we're doing well here. Questions, comments? I want to uh, once again acknowledge this last slide. Um, in my view, one of the real um, values that this board with three universities working together bring to the state is the opportunity to take the talent that exists not only here but at ASU and NAU and find ways to put those talents together to be greater than with uh, accomplish greater things than we can do individually. And I think that's an attitude and it's an intent to do that. Uh, let's leave the competition for the athletics and let's work together in ways that are good for Arizona and the people of Arizona. And I think we will find that we're successful beyond anything we could do individually if we can join forces. So I, I, I do believe that one of the reasons we selected you as a leader is that you took 59 different organizations that wouldn't even talk to each other and got them to collaborate and do wonderful things in Texas so we know it's possible. Yeah, so and, I, I, and I think as we discussed yesterday, uh, we're too small. I mean, we're, we're three universities, uh, um, but I think we punch way above our weight uh, when it comes to assets like uh, space. Um, uh, both uh, ASU and uh, U of A are true world leaders in this area. Uh, just look at the awards that are being given from NASA and NSF and others. So, and then on the health side, uh, you know, we, we've got two medical schools. We've got the partnership that ASU has with uh, Mayo. We've got NAU with the, the health sciences uh, schools that they have that are located in Phoenix. I just believe this is an incredible opportunity in both space and health, and uh, you know also the health of space travel, because uh, you know one of the taglines our students go to Mars, uh, literally and figuratively. It's great. I think we can get people to Mars, but can we get them back uh, safely and without cancer, for instance? So there there are a lot of opportunities here, but. The competition is not uh, up and down I-10 and 17. Uh, the competition is in Boston and San Francisco and San Diego and Singapore and London. And there's no reason, no reason in the world uh, that we can't have the right mentality to think we don't need to go to those places. We can do it right here. As a matter of fact, they're going to come to us. 
especially around the space uh, sector, I believe, because of all the unique assets that we, assets that we have. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Chairman, I want to just take advantage of the opportunity to talk about the inflection point that we are at. Um, we put the word collaboration up there, and we talk about it with the other two universities. But historically, this is, this is groundbreaking. <clears throat> Um, having lived, and I've, I said this yesterday, and, I, and, and I'm repeating myself, but it's worth repeating. Um, it wasn't that long ago that the three universities wouldn't, wouldn't talk to each other. Um, and, and I will tell you that 30 years ago when I was in student government at Arizona State University, I was part of that problem. Um, <laughs> I took my role as student body president quite serious and at every opportunity did, would do whatever I could to... Uh, to compete with U of A and, and try and come out on top. Um, but we have, we have moved far in the last 30 years, and, and I think with, with Dr. Robbins' leadership and his work with Dr. Crow and Dr. Chang is really historic, and it is, it is an inflection point for our state. Uh, it was said yesterday that our competition isn't ASU or, or NAU or U of A. It's the research triangle. It's these other states that have learned long ago to work together. That's our competition, and we are stronger together. And so um, for a lifelong uh, Arizonan, it is very refreshing to see this, and I think it bodes very, very well for our future. So thank you. Absolutely. Just a quick comment back on, on Regent de Gravina's question about financing. I, I'm just uh, very impressed and appreciative that Dr. Robinson, the University of Arizona, has not made this plan contingent on investment from the state. And in fact, have not really talked about investment from the state. However, I think the, the plan does a great job articulating the fantastic and unbelievable benefits that can come to the state and to the universities if the state was willing to invest in, in this plan. And, and I think gives us a great opportunity to go and articulate with, with the legislature and the governor's office the, the benefits of the 50-50 funding model and, and how we would put those additional resources to work should they become available. Thank you, Director Arnold. President Robbins. Okay, fourth pillar. It's our global and uh, international activities. And I have to thank uh, Brent White for uh, really uh, converting me. Uh, I'll talk uh, about our micro campuses uh, here in a minute, but these are our goals. You know, currently, um, we, we really haven't focused on trying to procure resources from uh, the World Bank or uh, the Gates Foundation or USAID, uh, uh, some of these uh, funding agencies that fund big international uh, developmental projects. And so we have a goal to, uh, by 2025, and I'm very confident that we could hit this goal to procure new resources that would help to pay for this plan. Uh, and, it, and it's a modest, in my opinion, $10 million. I think we can outperform that. Uh, we want to be a top 10 uh, national research university for students studying abroad. Right now, uh, we have uh, less than 5% of our students. We need to, to double that. We think that uh, uh, we can be a, a, a big performer in attracting more students to the university, international students, currently single digits. We need it in the, the 15 to 20% range. And then finally, I'll talk more about the, uh, the micro campuses. The micro campuses, um, uh, I, as, as I said, I was skeptical when I came in and uh, after sticking with it and uh, uh, investigating and multiple hours of discussions with Brent and Mark Miller and others. Uh, a recent trip to uh, one of our newest partner micro campus universities in, uh, in Lima, Peru, uh, people just came back excited about the opportunities there and then their team came here and they have a, a young, very uh, aggressive, uh, uh, visionary president, and, and I thought, you know, this this is starting to make a lot more sense to me, and as we went through and pressure tested it through this rigorous planning process, uh, I, I think the micro campus 
uh, differentiates us from any other university in the world. Uh, and the key is that our faculty develop the curriculum, then we train their faculty at our partner institutions uh, to deliver the curriculum, and we give a joint degree. And most importantly, uh, we split the tuition with them 50-50. Uh, and so this is one of the few things in this plan that, that uh, uh, generates resources to pay for itself. And I, I think it's, a, um, it's a, a really remarkable differentiating and competitive advantage for us. You can see a picture of one of our buildings there in, uh, in Cambodia one of our universities and uh, the the one that's been around the longest is with ocean university which is one of the top universities in china it, it gives us a ability to deliver our brand out to all these campuses in the world provides their students with a, a, a u.s uh, education and a degree uh, it gives us the opportunity to develop research collaborations with these universities and as a launch pad, a natural launch pad for our students as we try to grow our uh, study abroad programs. It, it, we already have infrastructure in place there and they're interesting places and stimulating places that we have partnerships with. Yes, Regent Manson. Thank you, Bobby. So, so this, this generates revenue at this point, so it's a profit center, as it were. What other, outside yes. of generating revenues, what, does, what do the numbers look like in terms of our students using these facilities currently? And what kind of return, if any, do we have of students coming from the American University of Phnom Penh and studying at U of A for a year? You know, and one of your goals is to increase the international student population at the U of A campus in Tucson. Do those flow together? Right. Well, that's the hope. These are all very nascent programs, and, and uh, others could answer those questions more accurately than me. But I do know there's, there are a couple of examples of um, uh, a law program uh, with the University of Hanoi, which is one of the top law schools in, in the country of Vietnam, uh, that before we started the, the program there, uh, we essentially got no students, and I think over the last few years we've gotten 10 law students that have come from there. The idea is that, that students could complete their undergraduate studies uh, at these micro campuses or even transfer uh, during their time, or they could come here from graduate school. So I, I don't think the numbers are really high right now, and we only have about 500 students. One of the goals was uh, to be 10,000 students. We only have 500. Uh, 26 students today. So it's early on and there are only four uh, operating campuses, but I know Brent and his team is out uh, and hope to develop 20 of these campuses with, with, uh, with the number of students per campus of, that will get us to 10,000 students. And at that point, uh, it should be um, you know, matured enough that we'll see our students going to these campuses. But I, I think there have been students who've gone to Ocean uh, to, uh, as part of, if not a complete semester of study abroad, but at least go there on a trip and, and understand what the resources are that we could develop a program there eventually. That's the hope. But I don't think we've gone very far with it today. <coughs> I'm under the impression, maybe mistakenly, that not a lot of universities are focusing on uh, micro campuses or partnerships uh, with other nations. And uh, I know there's a lot going on in China, uh, possibly India, Southeast Asia. Do you plan to be in the forefront uh, of this? And what is the planning? Uh, I mean, what resources are you going to put to this uh, immediately, and where do you expect this? To, I, I know you have the statistics, but is it a? Do we need to make uh, inroads in this quicker <laughs> than uh, down the road, since other universities may well start getting into this type of thing because everyone's out for the international student now. Yeah, I, I think this is one of the things that we highlighted for you yesterday, and I don't have those numbers with me, but I think we left them with you. It's this uh, uh, initiative 
uh, calls for about a, a million dollar, million and a half dollar investment in the next year, uh, which we're happy to do. Uh, but Brent is out there. I mean, you know, his, uh, if he's not global service on United and whatever it is on American, I would be shocked. Uh, he's probably premier status on multiple airlines because he's constantly out there uh, looking for opportunities. Now, as to, as to other institutions, of course, they've been at it for a long time. I mean, NYU does this very well. You know if you go to NYU, it's marketed very well. There are 14 sites in the world that you can go. And it's a big part of the, the experience there. And others have tried it too. They, they've, in my opinion, been the most successful. Uh, but most places choose to invest bricks and mortar and programs and their people uh, on the ground. And that just has not been as successful. And you've seen places like Johns Hopkins and Duke and Harvard and Stanford uh, retreat from those models. Stanford still has a program in, in Beijing, but uh, not as big as the, the idea that we had before. And I think Brent is onto something because uh, you can do multiple of these campuses without a big investment. And it's about relationship building and, uh, and getting uh, the right fit for, for their needs with the programs that we have. So we're on this. He's very aggressively going after this. Uh, I think it's going to be minimal investment. But we outlined that this is one of the, as we go through and put, as we talked to you yesterday about the triage and prioritization of projects, this would be one of them. And I think it's about a million and a half, $2 million investment that we're eagerly putting that money to work because we think the return on investment is going to be good. President Robbins, before you go on to the next section of this one, I apologize, Rick. Uh, I'm just curious, what are the implications for your general education and the changes to general education? That's one question. If you could deal with that one, I have a related one, though. For the the, the international yeah. program? Yeah. You, yeah. You, you, you talk about, you know, your, your global goals and what you want out of the students in this section. So how does general education change as a consequence of this? Yeah, so I think it's a great opportunity for our students. We. Uh, we talk about uh, wanting, at one point, um, uh, we said we want 100% of our students to have an international experience. I still believe that that's embedded somewhere in this plan, but I got, kind of got pushed back on that because, and, and the fact is, we could put them in a bus and drive uh, a few hours south and they could do meaningful work along the border and in Sonora, mm -hmm. and that counts. Uh, and, and so <coughs> I think that that is a great part of the general education uh, process. There is, a, there is a, you know, don't have enough time to put it all in here, and some of these things are a little controversial, but there is a pilot project that we continue to talk about uh, with Minerva uh, to introduce their curriculum uh, into our general education uh, projects, pilot projects for next fall. Brent has looked at Minerva's platform and said, this is going to be a great way for us to deliver general education across all of our micro campuses. Um, so I, I think that they fit together. Obviously. Bobby, would you explain Minerva for everyone's benefit? Ooh, that's going to be a long, well, the most successful sure. university in the world, Minerva. You want a tagline? It's a tagline. And so uh, they've only been around about four years, and they have a, uh, a very, uh, uh, aspirational goal to um, uh, to change the way that education is delivered. Uh, they have uh, uh, we've been talking to them now for about a year about their offerings, uh, particularly around the software and platform that they use to deliver uh, their offering. They only take a hundred students a year, uh, and they have multiple thousands of students applying in. Uh, it, it's really an online uh, educational platform, but the students start, uh, there are eight different locations, I think, and, and I'm not an expert on giving the Minerva pitch here, but I'm going to do the best I can. And I'll say you, you can find them at www. whatever it is, Minerva, just Google. But, but the idea is they've got an incredible uh, software platform and uh, uh, data analytics 
that they film every class and they, they um, use, uh, they're the ultimate in collaborative and active learning in the classroom. Uh, and we just think that that's, that's gonna be uh, a potentially interesting pilot for us to pilot uh, in our general education curriculum. Above and beyond that, Brent thinks this is a great way for us to, to disseminate our curriculum around to our micro campuses. A, a related question though, President Robbins, before you go on, and by the way, it's minerva.kgi.edu. There you go. Just if you want the, uh, uh, the <laughs> address. But uh, with regard to the languages, you talk about 75 per stu students being multilingual. Now having studied both German, Spanish, and Fr actually, and French, uh, I, I'm probably only useful in about one of those. Uh, and, and it had to do with the pedagogy. So how are you going to change the pedagogy in languages taught here at the University of Arizona? Well, I think, uh, I thought you were going to ask me, this is why I didn't want to put this one on here, because this was, because <laughs> it says not measured today. We don't, we don't know how many uh, students are multilingual. Um, the idea well, is... They're typical Americans, they're monolingual. Yeah, but, but I recognize there's probably more multilingual people in the Southwest than there are in many parts of the country. Correct. And uh, uh, this is uh, Duolingo for all. You know, I can pull it out and show you how you can get multilingual on your, on your phone. But, um, it, you know, the idea would be that you would have a proficiency test that you could uh, give people. The, the fact is that... Um, I'm forgetting now which university. It's a requirement that in order to finish, you, you, you have to be proficient in, a, in two languages. Um, so the, the idea is that um, because of our uh, HSI status, mm -hmm. because of our, our desire to grow and better, be an internationally, uh, in, international leader in uh, uh, students from outside the U.S., we think that this is uh, something that we can achieve. Uh, the question is, how do we measure it? And that's always problematic. I, I guess this one is uh, maybe not as metrically best, uh, based as it is uh, uh, spiritually and aspirationally be, uh, based. Regent Myers. Yeah, just a, stepping aside just one second, I, I just wanted to suggest, Mr. Chair, you know, we, we had some discussion on these micro campuses. We talk about online education opportunities, um, the whole branding outside of the United States. And we know how important out of country students are to the learning experience for our students, the opportunity for resident students in Arizona to go to other countries, and the money that comes here from other countries to help support education. I was gonna suggest at some point this board should maybe look at this a little bit more. Because I, I don't know in, in my history on the board that we've really had a, a discussion about what out of country education means to Arizona. And, you know, I don't know that ABOR should be doing more advertising for Arizona schools or, you know, I, I, there are just so many open questions here. But it, I think we all recognize it's becoming and it's going to continue to be a more and more important important part of our overall student body and our student experience. So separate from this U of A presentation, I was going to suggest that this board, maybe in academic affairs, should take this subject on at some point and, and have more of an intellectual discussion about what are all these platforms and how do they fit together and what is the opportunity. Thank you, Regent Myers. Thank you. This, uh, this just is a slide to remind me to come back to. We've just not done a lot of uh, work in developing the procurement of resources that help us to go out and marshal our resources around uh, hydrology, uh, water expertise for arid environments, engineering prowess, uh, public health and, and natural resources uh, uh, assets that we have at the university to go out and partner and help solve uh, some of the world's uh, global challenges. I think we do a really good job, especially uh, with water, uh, in, in terms of uh, going across the state, uh, partnering with, with the uh, native communities, but also with the Middle East. There are a lot of um, uh, partnerships. Ben Guerin uh, University was here recently signing a, a research agreement because they live in a similar type 
uh, environment as we do. So there's, there are a lot of opportunities and we really, you know, until Brent brought this forward and the group started to think about what we could do around having global impact and procuring resources that would pay uh, for us to go and do these type of research partnerships and studies, uh, that th this, this is how um, important this is for us and, and made it into the plan. Uh, as we get these students on campus right now, uh, we don't do as good a job as, uh, as we could in terms of making them feel welcome, providing them with the uh, necessary resources uh, to retain them. It turns out that our international students are retained at a, at a fairly, fairly high level, but we'll have to increase that if we're going to hit our 91% uh, retention goal. And we make it difficult. We make it difficult for all of our students to, uh, uh, to have a joyful existence as they navigate through the university. So the idea would be to take the park uh, Street Union and repurpose it and renovate it into an international uh, uh, center for students so that they don't have to run uh, all over campus and many times uh, out uh, into the city uh, 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 miles away from campus when uh, they may not have a car. Most of them don't have a car when they come here. So the idea that we would have different services for passports, uh, I really like the idea that every one of our students needs to have a passport. And if we had an office there that made it easy uh, to go to get that passport, then I think more of our students would have them. It'll, it, you know, when our uh, basketball team went to Barcelona last year, I think probably nine out of the 12 didn't have a passport. So um, uh, to, to process visas, uh, to, to be able to get their financial aid and support from their country, country of origin um, and to provide a, a cultural center for events, um, watching World Cup soccer games, for instance, or uh, having food services that could be, um, you know, the best in the region could be right here in the center. So we're pretty excited about uh, repurposing this and the... the um, modest amount of uh, resources that were required to do that. So that's the end of our international story. Thank you. Okay. We're coming down the home stretch here. Pillar 5 talks about how can we run this university in a more um, efficient manner, not only uh, with business operations, but also with processes that simply make everyone's job easier to do every day. Uh, I remember uh, uh, an encounter with the deans early on where uh, we were talking about the need or lack thereof of doing a strategic plan and many of them uh, told me that you don't need a strategic plan to do X, Y, and Z. There are things that drive us crazy every day that we have to put up with and you don't need any strategies for that. You just need to change them. So I said, okay, go home and uh, you know, write down the 10 things that make your job difficult every day and come back and we'll collate them and slice them and dice them and analyze them. And many of the things showed up in this plan. Uh, and uh, uh, Jeff was uh, kind enough to take, take on the, the job of, uh, of uh, going through and analyzing uh, many of these things. But most of them make sense and most of them, uh, uh, such as uh, we, we don't have a, a common platform that ties us together. So a new CRM system is going to be very important and will be part of this plan. Uh, we want to focus on uh, sustainability and we've got some plans that uh, uh, to outsource some of our utility uh, requirements um, that would reduce uh, our carbon footprint and our scope two admissions that will cost us nothing. Uh, and result in a 33% reduction. And then finally, uh, you know, require, make it where I think every student now has to have a CAT card. We would make it where every student has to have some digital uh, access uh, to what we're calling Digital U, which would be a platform that would help everyone uh, run through their, their university experience. Um, uh, with a much more joyful and purposeful uh, experience. I, I use the uh, idea of 
if we go next door to the administration building, there are a bunch of seats out there and I kept asking for a picture to put in this presentation. I should have just gone over there and taken the picture myself and put it in here. But there's an uh, uh, old computer there that I think people are lining up to sign into this computer so that they can get financial aid or uh, uh, you know access to, and, and, and it's just, it shows you what a second industrial revolution type uh, operation we have going on and how that by putting us on one common platform that we would make people's life easier every day and we could actually, even though it requires some uh, upfront uh, sizable investment over the long term, it'll make us run more efficiently, make us more productive and cost uh, less. Uh, one other thing, I, I just put this slide in here uh, to emphasize that at the start of every strategic planning process, uh, usually you go through missions, uh, uh, mission statements, vision statements, and develop core values. And, and we chose not to do that uh, in this case uh, because we, we felt we had limited time and we thought uh, this was already adopted from the last strategic plan and we thought these were pretty good. Um, uh, I, I don't think anybody could argue with any of these core values or this mission. But as we went through the process, we realized that they're not commonly uh, uh, shared. Most people don't know about them. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're from ASU, you can give the guiding principles of the New American University. And I'm not sure that, uh, uh, you know, anybody can really recite for you what our, our core values and purpose are here. So as a, uh, as a postlude to this process, we're going to engage uh, in a, uh, a process with the Purpose Institute out of Austin, Texas, and go from a uh, grassroots level, uh, all stakeholder, alumni from around the world, all students, staff, faculty, and go through this process of developing a shared set of um, uh, uh, goals, uh, purposes uh, and values that that everybody would buy into and would know and would be part of of uh, who we are in our true North Star as a university so we're looking forward to that uh, as part of analyzing our current culture I alluded to earlier an organizational health uh, initiative and survey that we did uh, sent it out to 15,000 uh, students, employees, and uh, faculty member and got, you know, about a 33% response rate. And I talked about things uh, that we have strengths in in terms of talent uh, and uh, passion, and, uh, uh, but that things that we lack were role clarity, a strategic uh, uh, vision for the future, uh, holding people accountable, uh, defining what their jobs are, giving them performance reviews uh, to either help them improve or to reward them. And that's one of the things that, uh, that we haven't done as good a job of. And I hope that if this plan is successful, we can find the money to, uh, to execute on the plan, that, we will, that we'll have resources so that we can give uh, financial incentives to our higher performers because we haven't done as good a job of that uh, as, as we probably uh, could do or should do. And then finally, just having more central uh, organizational leadership or, you know, just the idea of not having a, a common uh, CRM. It has implications on business operations, makes us more efficient, should help us with uh, saving some money. Uh, but the other thing it allows us to do is to have better cybersecurity. Uh, and not have, you know, 250 different separate servers, but have everybody on the same uh, platform. Uh, so those are some of the things that I, I think will, uh, will be very, not as glamorous as some of the other parts of the plan, but certainly practical, helps people live their daily lives and uh, helps them uh, be more excited about coming to work because they don't have to fight all the red tape and bureaucracy. Of course, there's always gonna be some of that. But we give this example here about, we've already started, uh, and as part of this strategic planning process, had this, which seems to be small, 
uh, uh, initiative, but we just couldn't resist going ahead and getting it going. Uh, it used to take for travel authorization, if I said, I want to go, I have a meeting at the NIH next uh, tomorrow, and I need to leave tomorrow. Well, I needed to start planning that about a week in advance, obviously going to plan it, but getting authorization to even go um, in, the, in the second industrial revolution that we were operating in a year ago, uh, it would require about a week of signing five or six different, uh, getting five or six different signatures on paper that made its way around the university, uh, and then you would get your approval. Now, today, I'm told, uh, that we can just hit a button and uh, do it electronically. Small, small example, but you start to get the picture. When we have these, uh, these, this infrastructure, it can make us work more uh, successfully. And then, uh, this is the digital you. Think of this as the Amazon uh, offering for students, where they can get access to uh, their course selection, manage their financial aid, uh, and other uh, things that um, uh, will make their life easier so that they can spend more time studying uh, uh, in uh, improving uh, their performance. We think it'll help with retention. We uh, Certainly on financial aid, if we could get it to them sooner, many people, the two main regions, reasons that we don't retain students are mental health issues and financial issues. So if I have to wait three months to get my financial aid, um, then I'm at a high risk of, uh, of dropping out because I have to go get a job and uh, you know, and it delays me from graduation. So we think that some of these technological challenges, if we're going to be the uh, the land grant university in the fourth industrial revolution, we've got to be able to practice what we're espousing. We're going to uh, give to our students and, and to the outside world. So we're almost at the end here. Uh, one of the things to get back to, you know, what what are we going to do? Is this the is this the end of the process? Uh, it, and, and I've said this now, I think, three or four times, it's the, uh, it's the end of the beginning. This is the structure that we'll have. We'll have a strategic implementation group. We uh, have sent out uh, a, a, an advertisement to hire someone to run this uh, plan, to oversee the whole thing. We'll have um, accountable pillar owners for all five of the pillars and then initiative owners. And um, there will be weekly check-ins uh, about which, which initiative uh, uh, on each of the initiatives. And this, is, this would be, it's not really intuitive, but I wanted, a, uh, I wanted an example that I could show you. So these are the five pillars, and each one of these blocks represents uh, uh, an initiative. And, and so we'll come back to you and show you uh, if we show you that there, and we'll do this on a quarterly basis, not only to report to the regions, but we'll have it on a website and we'll be very transparent about which initiative we're, we're actually executing on and what the results are. So you probably won't hear a lot about the ones that are in green, but if there's some issue and they're in the cautionary yellow part or if we need uh, to have a, uh, a SWAT team go in and, and help on an initiative because it's just not going, um, then this kind of tracking system and reporting system and metric system will help us as we go out and execute. Uh, we've got to get the resources. We've got A, B, and C tranches. A is the one that uh, we're already doing. We're already investing in. B is the one that we've committed to invest in. C would be uh, the ones that we'll go and raise money for uh, and invest in as we go out and inspire people uh, to invest in these uh, programs that will help us to uh, uh, be a better university and in many ways improve the world. So we, we will report back to you on uh, several things. One, the, the values and purpose uh, work that we're going to do over the next two or three months. Um, the update on where the Banner Health Sciences strategic plan as it starts to roll out. And I've, I've uh, mentioned RCM. Uh, we'll, we'll come back and talk to you about what our ideas are about uh, our budgetary process and uh, what, what uh, uh, changes we need to make to, to RCM. Uh, I think there's, there are going to be some changes that are being discussed by the task force. And as I said, I, I look forward to, to hearing those. Um, 
the final thing on this slide is we, we obviously um, have three important hires that we're searching for right now. All of these searches are, are underway. Uh, the provost, the CFO and chief business officer, and the senior vice president for research and innovation. And I think this plan will be, um, will be a good way for us to engage candidates. I, I think it'll be something that will excite them. Uh, it will give them uh, tangible evidence about what this university is about and where we see uh, ourselves going over the next 5, 10, 15 years. And it'll be sort of a litmus test that we can use to engage people about, you know, what do you think about the direction of the plan? Could you see yourself, you know, being part of this uh, leadership team to help uh, implement this plan? So I, I think it, the, these hires are going to be incredibly important going forward, and uh, they're three of the most important parts of the university, uh, and over the next six months, we'll have these people in place. So I've given you now uh, almost four hours of this, uh, and it's just a very small part of the tens of thousands of hours that we spent putting this plan together. You know, so as we seek to raise Arizona, uh, to ascend our mountain peak, uh, to make the, the, uh, uh, the state of Arizona the future state, I'm, I'm drawn to these words by our alum, uh, Allison Levine, who uh, I think is uh, one of the first and maybe only women to summit all of the world's tallest peaks and ski to uh, the North Pole and the South Pole uh, while working at Goldman Sachs. I don't know how she did all that. <laughs> uh, but I, I love this, and we wanted to have her here, but she's, uh, she's off climbing some mountain. Uh, but I love this quote. You know, you don't have to be the best, the fastest, strongest climber to get to the top of the mountain. You just absolutely have to be relentless of putting one foot in front of the other. And that's what's going to happen with this plan. Um, we, we will have to, uh, every day, step by step, do the hard work of recruiting those students and getting them here and, and helping them be successful. And the long hours of writing grants and, and uh, winning those grants to, to advance our research, there's no magic bullet. There's no magic formula. It's just a lot of hard work. And I think Allison summarized it very well. So thank you for putting up with my uh, uh, rambling through and bumbling and stumbling along here. But I'm, I'm really uh, uh, very proud to be the representative to, uh, to give you at least a snapshot of the incredible work that the people uh, around us have put together. And, and I think this is a, is a start to a great roadmap uh, for where the university is going to go over the next 5, 10, 15 years. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, President Robbins. I'd like to uh, offer the opportunity to the regents to uh, make any comments or ask any questions at the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, Regent Krishna. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. There will be so many naysayers in this group, I think, faculty especially. We want to tell Dr. Robbins that we are behind him on everything he has said. He has a great vision. We want to support him once all the way. Thank you, Richard Thank Christa. you, Richard Christa. Others? So thank you, Dr. Robbins, for that presentation. Um, so I think, personally, being uh, one of your students now here at the U of A, I'm proud to know that this is the direction that the university is headed. I'm excited and inspired by um, what you've presented here. And I think the most exciting part for me and maybe for Regent D'Agravina too, is that student success is such a clear thread between all of the pillars. And it's something that you drew attention to and something that um, is really important to us and, and to your student body and your, and your student population. Um, and so I hope that you'll continue that as you go forward and implement each of these things, um, which I'm sure you will. And specifically with the general education conversation, um, it's something that we've talked a lot with uh, 
the students about and they're super interested um, in where general education is going and how they can participate in that formation. And so I hope that um, you'll call on them as the real grassroots kind of people to tell you what um, general education means to us as students and how it can be best utilized um, in our education. But overall, I'm, I'm really excited and I, and I think the student success part is vital and very clear um, and I think people will be excited to see that this is where the university is headed. Thank you for those comments and you know as I keep saying the the medical system wasn't necessarily designed for patients but the leading institutions are now uh, uh, formulating patient-centric uh, delivery of care and I think the same thing about higher education we, we don't necessarily uh, have set this up to be the most student-friendly or the most student centric and it's an opportunity in this point in time for for the University of Arizona to be a leader in this area. So I, I appreciate both of your inputs in this tr uh, planning process and all of our students, particularly uh, Natalyn and uh, our student body president and Marie, our graduate and uh, professional student body president and others like Anthony and uh, people who've helped us and set in, particularly on these general education uh, discussions. Um, it, it's been enlightening to me, it's been invigorating, uh, and I think we're to a place now uh, where we've got a, a, a common set of shared values around learning outcomes and skills and things that uh, we, we need our students to achieve. And I think it's gonna be exciting for them instead of just picking from 400 different courses and trying to find the easiest day they can get and uh, not having any themes or any structure uh, to go through. Um, this will, I think this is gonna be a much better way to uh, impart general education uh, and it, it's gonna help them, as I said before, in any discipline they choose to go into. Other regents, Regent Penley. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, President Robbins, I, I really appreciate what you've done. As, as we said earlier, uh, all of us have had a chance to uh, really be a part of, of this uh, along the way. But, but I would just say I, I, I especially appreciate the planned sensitivity to the culture of the University of Arizona, uh, as well the challenge that it presents to this institution because it pre is both sensitive to the culture but it presents the institution with challenge. I think you've got, done a really outstanding job of, of embedding this plan in the place that we have today, Arizona, Tucson, the Southwest. Uh, I, I think that's admirable as well. The engagement, as I already indicated, that is so broad, I think helps to move this plan forward. The fact that you've established a roadmap in a way for the future and that you've committed yourself to persistence and accountability in the last slide or two that you've presented. But what I hope we'll also begin to see, and I think we will, is these sequential imperatives that are going to be so basic to getting this plan implemented along the way and the clarity with which those imperatives, those strategic imperatives have to be articulated, uh, that's going to be an essential part too, and I look forward to that. But I, I know you understand that, but uh, it, it's, it's really a great beginning. Uh, and all of us who watched you undertake this knew it would not be easy. We knew it would present you with a lot of work ahead, and I just laud what you've done so far and look forward to the future with you. Thank you, Regent Penley, and thank you for all your help. Uh, having been through this before, you're, uh, along with President Schaefer and President Likens, as I said before, you've been uh, of great help to me and will continue to, uh, will continue to have good exchange of ideas, and I know that you will hold my feet to the fire, and, and uh, you know, I get to run around and see the incredible stories of this university every day, and. Uh, so I, I simply, you know, steal their slides and, and brag about them. <laughs> Regent Heiler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Robbins and Dr. Robbins' team, thank you very much. Uh, this was very interesting and engaging and promising. But I have to say you probably had me 
when you quoted the new radicals yes. at the beginning of the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and, and there's another song on that same album, which was the only album they ever had that yes. was any good, and there yeah. were only two songs they ever had that were any good, and the other one is called Someday We'll Know. <laughs> um, <which is> equally, <laughs> equally pertinent yes. um, um, to, to the presentation. And I'm glad that you um, put your distinguished Wildcat alumnus up here at the conclusion. Uh, as you know, um, she makes her way in life uh, quite a bit these days, going around and speaking to leadership uh, groups, groups of leaders. Um, and another quote from her, um, which I was able to quickly identify as I had heard it before, is that we tend to think that progress has to happen in one particular direction but that's not the case. Sometimes you're going to have to go backwards for a bit in order to get where you eventually want to be, um, which she absorbed from returning to the base camp on ascent of Everest um, before she got there. Um, and so finally, the other point she also made in those same remarks is that um, leaders must bear pain with grace and vigor uh, so I wish you the best in that, <laughs> um, in I'm that part. I'm bearing the pain. I'm working on the grace and vigor. And, and, and you, have, you have already demonstrated that um, uh, in your short time as president at U of A, uh, as, as you have so many other distinctive qualities of leadership. And so we um, we're very fortunate to have you here and to have the team you've assembled. And um, we're very excited about the future of the University of Arizona. We, we played uh, Tears for Fears at every meeting because uh, the song Everybody Wants to Rule the World is applicable. <laughs> Richard Myers. Yeah, Dr. Robbins, just in the spirit of the arts that you brought up a number of times, just for you and the entire team, I just want to say bravo. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. Anyone else? Regent DeGravino. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, something that I wanted to say for the end is more. Uh, I just, I'm really impressed with how the strategic plan also has not only the student-centric focus, but also the global approach as we are entering a more globalized world. Um, every day, the world is changing, and the fact that the University of Arizona wants to stay on top of that, I think is a key component to the strategic plan, and that's what's gonna keep higher education relevant moving forward. Thank you. So President Robbins, I uh, want to echo the comments of everyone uh, that has spoken here today and their support for you and for the faculty and students and everyone in this community that will need to get behind this. So from the board, uh, I hope that you all see this as a call to action. This is not just a plan that will sit on the shelf, but rather a plan that each of you have to commit to. Each of you have to be a part of finding that path forward and doing what you can, providing the leadership at your level that's necessary for it to succeed. As, um, as was said earlier, this is a really an inflection point for this university in Southern Arizona. University of Arizona means everything to Tucson and Southern Arizona. You have so uh, much influence on our future. So we're counting on you to do the things that are necessary to make this plan a reality. I really liked Pillar 5. Because while it isn't very uh, exciting, maybe compared to some of the other things, it talks about your understanding that the amount of resources this, gonna, this is going to take will require finding efficiencies and effectiveness. So as we execute, we have to find ways to do more in the most efficient way possible. That will resonate with the, the legislature and the governor who hopefully will fund part of this. But it also resonates with everybody who's watching what happens here. Being efficient and effective and excellent is a combination that's hard to beat. And I think we're on the doorstep of that. So I'm truly excited. I congratulate you uh, for a job well done today. And it is the, the beginning now as we roll up our sleeves to start the work. So I'm going to save the final comment to our esteemed Wildcat. Wildcat and uh, <laughs> previous chair. So I do have to do one bit of business. 
I move that the board accept the University of Arizona's <laughs> operational and financial review. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Your plan is approved. Congratulations. And now to our immediate past chair. Final comment. Well, from this grateful wildcat, I only have two words. Bear down. <laughs> we are adjourned.